So, I was uh, hiking in the Andes uh, the other day, and uh, there was a massive storm blowing in. I could see it was going to be a doozy. And anyway, my Sherpa said to me, Han, you have an exquisite beverage brain. How? I mean, you're like, you're like the lawnmower man of wine. What is it that enables you to unlock and communicate the secrets of wine in such engaging fashion? Now, none of that, none of that actually happened, but I thought I'd answer the question anyway. What is it that makes a wine either super interesting or super boring to me? And, uh, and it can really be unlocked with, with six elements, really, which is the drivers of flavor that make up any wine, which be the place, the fruit, the maker, the yeast, the vessels, or the wine's legacy. Now, for those of you who, like Johnny Mnemonic, love a, a good uh, acronym, you could use the sentence, please find me some vine leaves. Please for place, right? The most interesting wines will often be from a single lot or a single uh, uh, block of vine. I've talked about savage wines before from Stonehaven where you have um, the vine equivalent of a, a child suffering domestic abuse and they grow up strong and gnarly and super interesting like Jim John Davis from Corn. That is uh, what makes a wine interesting with regards to a place. Or fruit. I was at the Roth promo show today looking at what Johan Kruger is doing with his wines and hearing a story about him having to buy a whole bunch of Palomino so that he could also get his old vine chenins. And yet he made that Palomino into a fascinating wine, which if you haven't had Palomino dry and serious, you should try it. So after fruit, we've got the maker. I just mentioned Johan and Duncan, but it could have been anyone. Could have been, could have been David Nevoet, for example. Um, who is worked in Chile and he's worked in South Africa and he's got three or four different wine labels all achieving totally different things and uh, clearly a man with vision who is willing to experiment and try new things. So you could hunt down a wine purely because it was made by David and that in, in itself is interesting enough. And if that wasn't enough, you could go onto the yeast. So I said, please find me some vine leaves. So the yeast is actually the, the sum which is Saccharomyces cerevisiae uh, because it fitted in with my neat sentence. But while we all get very excited about spontaneous fermentation and we all love to have the mystery unlocked, we don't want, who knows what it's gonna taste like, no one will know because the yeast is so spontaneous it could come out wearing a bowler hat and pink stockings. You just don't know, right? Because inoculation is so boring. And yet, if you look closely, inoculated yeasts have been designed to deliver certain results, which means actually, done with an imaginative palette of yeasts, you can produce some incredible results by uh, nudging or guiding wines in various ways. So I don't buy into the thought that the only way to make an exciting wine is to have spontaneous fermentation. I think that's a little short-sighted. Um, and that's why Saccharomyces cerevisiae in all its variety is worth exploring more completely than simply uh, only looking at spontaneous fermentation. Then there are vessels, vine leaves. Vessels can be anything from old oak to new oak to foudres to two 25 liter barrels to uh, stainless steel tanks to concrete eggs. Again, talking about Johan Kruger, I just tasted a whole bunch of his wines that uh, were fermented in concrete tanks and then moved across the hall to taste some of, uh, of Belea's wines. We had a, a completely um, amphora fermented Chardonnay, which was probably my wine of the night. And to me, this is fascinating. Is it wood? Is it steel? Is it a combination? Is it concrete? Is it uh, amphora made of, um, of clay? I mean, this is stuff that to me is gonna change the way a wine tastes. And finally, you have a wine's legacy. Vine leaves L for legacy. Uh, and that's, where does the wine come from? If you taste Springfield's 1997 Cabernet Sauvignon, the, the lost vintage, it's got a fascinating story when you discover how they were changing their winemaking at the time and how a few little miscalculations here and there between skin contact and fermentation time led to this wine that was a tannic monster that needed 20 years in order to be ready to drink. And of course that applies to a whole number of um, elements of winemaking, especially in South Africa, that has quite a checkered winemaking history. So, if you want to know what makes a wine interesting to me, please find me some vine leaves. It's place, it's fruit, it's maker. Saccharomyces cerevisiae, what yeast are they using? The vessels it's fermented in. And finally, what is the wine's legacy? When did it come from? Where did it come from? And that will tell you a little bit why it tastes the way it does today. So if you appreciate this approach to wine, uh, almost, I guess, deconstructing it into the drivers of flavor that make wine what it is, 
I have a feeling you'll probably enjoy some more posts that I'll be putting up on uh, my Instagram feed shortly.